Yo, what up guys? Parker Welbeck here with another virtual job shadow. We're going to be today talking about how to shoot an interview. And guess what? We have here a bunch of full-time filmmaker members here to shadow and we're going to be utilizing them to do some Q&A. So while I'm shooting an interview, they're going to be asking questions so that you guys can get the most out of this experience. So step number one, first thing I do, I walk in and I say, all right, where do I want to set up my interview? That's step number one, finding the right location. So basically my process for this, mostly what I'm looking for is good lighting and good leading lines, good composition. So I'm going to be looking around, looking through my camera and find a spot where where I think we have a dynamic shot that can show some depth, show some leading lines, and that has some good lighting. I'm looking, I see I got some cool brick, we got some good windows. So one thing when I'm gonna be doing this interview is I want separation from the back wall that's gonna help me create some depth. So I'm not gonna ever wanna plaster him right up against a wall. And I'm gonna see how it looks. This spot looks good, it looks clean, so this is a potential option. Let's keep looking around. Some good leading lines going down this way. So James, let's put you right here. And then I'm gonna see what it would look like having... Okay, so I really like the look of this because we have these pillars here. Come a little bit farther this way so I can get more of that first pillar. Okay, so I'm rolling. As you can see, we have a lot of depth. We have these pillars to the left. They give us some good depth. We have all these windows to the right giving it good depth. And so right now I'm thinking this is probably gonna be the spot I end up using because it is so pretty. But we'll keep looking real quick. Um, this is also a good leading line spot. We'll just use Brendo here as our man. Roll some of that for you too. Okay, good. But I'm gonna go ahead and say that I like this spot where we can see the pillars. So yeah, that's gonna be the spot we choose. Um, that's spot number two. And we'll now set up all the gear. So I'm sticking a Manfrotto plate on the bottom of my Rhino slider here. And now we're gonna mount it to my Manfrotto tripod here. Use my second tripod head to put on here. Grab my camera. Let's have you come a little farther out. Maybe right there should be good. And as far as heights of your camera, you want it to be somewhat close to the eye line of your subject. Doesn't have to be right on. Can be a little lower, a little higher, but so we're actually about there already. I like that. Cool. I'm liking my framing. This works, but there's a ton of garbage in the background. We have a lot of our guys' gears back there. So one thing I talk about is it's not only what's in your frame, but it's also what's not in your frame. So check for things that distract, take away from the subject, which is our guy talking here. So let's go ahead and now and, and remove anything that's in the frame that we don't want in there. So I got this camera rolling to show you what I'm looking at here. I'm trying to get you know my framing the way I like it, both you know, left and right and up and down. And so I'm looking at what's in my shot, what's not in my shot. We're deciding how much of his body I want. This camera angle is gonna be probably waist up, so a medium shot. And then I'll have my second camera just a tight on the face. Now I'm deciding how much I want my frame on either end. If I have him looking to off camera left, then I'm gonna wanna make sure that I'm framing to where he's on the right of the frame so there's more headroom in front of his face rather than behind his face. Now, sometimes I'll do center framing, but if I do center framing, I usually make sure my subject is looking directly at the camera. Now, if you guys are interviewing people who are super awkward on camera, which is most everybody, then it's usually not the best idea to have them looking directly at the camera. It's usually more natural to have them off camera and actually talking to a human being. That's much easier for people to, to do. You can also have them look straight at the camera if you have them positioned on one of the thirds. Um, that's what I do in my tutorial interviews is I'm off to a third and I'm still looking directly at the camera. Another thing we'll talk about here is headroom. So when I'm framing this up, I also want his eyes not only on a third this way, but a third that way as well. So I'm looking to set him up on one of these two thirds like that. If I have this tilted up and his head is in the center of the frame, I would personally say that's poorly framed, that there's too much headroom above. And if you bring it too low, where his head's touching the frame like that, I would say you're showing a little bit too much of his body and not enough, giving him enough headroom right there. So you, want, you don't want your audience to feel constrained, like they're claustrophobic inside your, your framing. Okay, so we have our A camera set up where we like it. We'll show you where it'll be sliding on these tracks in just a second, but first I wanna get my B camera set up. So I'm deciding if I want to have my B camera on the left or the right. I have this on to show you what I'm looking at here. I'm just trying to decide. I'm going to do a, a tight shot of just his face here. This is what it looks like on his right side. Our main source of light right now is over here. This is our key light. So ideally I'd be shooting on the shadow side of his face for my B camera. And so if the lighting stays this way, I'm gonna end up having the camera on this side. So Kyle asked me why I choose the shadow side to roll the second camera, uh, mostly for creative taste. I've studied Hollywood directors like Shane Hurlbut, and that's 
generally what they do in Hollywood, at least. But once I watched Hollywood films and, and actually looked, yeah, mostly when there's two people talking to each other, they usually have the camera on the shadow side. So just kind of interesting, but that's how it's generally done in Hollywood. I've kind of followed suit and I found that, yeah, I actually do prefer it. Now that I have seen it in movies and recognize it, I'm like, yeah, it does look better to me to have it on the shadow side. When you're shooting on the light side, everything's lit up. So you don't see as many shadows, you don't see as much depth. It is more of more of the depth that it creates shooting on the shadow side. You can do both, neither of them is wrong. Go ahead and watch a Hollywood movie, you'll see they usually do the shadow side, but some scenes are on the bright side. It's not, there's no right or wrong way. All right, so for now we might change this, but I'm deciding that he's gonna be looking off camera right. I'm personally gonna be sitting right here interviewing him, talking to him. So now that we have our cameras positioned ready to go, now we're going to bring in the lighting. So what we have here is the Aperture 120D with the light dome. This is my favorite go-to light when it comes to shooting interview style stuff like this because it is such a soft light with this dome that it makes it super flattering on the face. So I try and get this as close as I can to my subject without being in the shot. So if you guys watch my tutorial videos, this thing is literally like three feet from my face when I'm shooting interviews because I want this to wrap around my whole face to make it softer. Now we already have a lot of soft light pouring in, so we actually may not need a whole lot of artificial light today. The idea though for me is like I said when I was looking into the camera before I noticed that on his face I had to bump up my exposure to get his face exposed right but then that put the background kind of overexposed so I'm trying to bring in a little bit more light to match the rest of this light so that his face can be brighter than the background. Now let's bring in the lights. This is one of the biggest things I'm looking for when I light is these shadows on the face so if I bring this over here see we're creating more of a split lighting right as I bring it over here, we're lighting up more of that side of his face and you can see the shadows right along there. So that's what we're trying to do, create depth, create that shadow. And then with this height, brings in shadow under the chin to give us that nice drop shadow. So we want it above him and slightly to one side now. Now I can bring my exposure down and see how it brings the background to be darker than the subject. All right, so now we're gonna bring in a second light for a backlight. This is the Lightstorm 1 by Aperture. This is the bicolor version. I like to put it on the opposite side of the key lights, get it nice and high, coming down on them like so. But let's talk about color temperature because this is a bicolor light, so we have the option if we want to go 3200 Kelvin or 5500 Kelvin, which is what this range is to. Outside light is daylight, which is gonna be around 5600 Kelvin. This light dome is 6000 Kelvin, which is a little bit bluer than the outdoor light, but it's close. For now, I'm gonna try and match this with all the other lights and put this at 5500 Kelvin. The purpose of the backlight, we've talked about this in the lighting video, is to out line your subject to kind of make them separate from the background. So go ahead and turn that on, Edward. So you see how it kind of lights up that shoulder there? I'm gonna call that good, I like what I see. All right, so there's our lighting setup. We've got the light dome as our key light, the light storm as our backlight here. So here's Brando and he's on set going to help us set up the audio. I'm gonna be asking him questions of what he looks for and, and how he's setting things up and any questions as we go. I cover audio in the course, but not in depth. This guy does this for a profession. He goes on giant film sets and just does the audio. So he's the man, he runs a course. You guys can check it out at The Filmmaker's Guide to Audio. So yeah. take it away. So the first thing you wanna do is address what your environment is. But in today's video, we're gonna work with the Rode NTG3, which is a shotgun microphone. The NTG3 I've used for years. It was like my first microphone uh, that I use professionally. I always tell everyone to get the NTG3. If they ever say, is there one mic? I would say the NTG3. So one common mistake that people make is they're either like, well, the, the number one is that people always record way too far away. So for example, they record their audio on a video mic pro, like that's sitting on top of this camera. They will say, why does the audio sound so bad? It sounds like they're, you know, 200 feet away. And it's like, right, because they are. So what we're gonna do is we wanna get this mic really close to the person's face, which leads me to the second common mistake I see when people mic people up, and that is people think they need to be as physically close as possible, which is not true. Microphones are like human ears. When you're placing a microphone, think about it critically and say, well, if you were having a conversation with someone, where would you be? Like, obviously this is a little close, but this is kind of where we'd be talking. And so we wouldn't be here unless, well, some, some people do, and that's fine, that's fine. So what we wanna do is think kind of a natural position, right? So I like the six, eight inch up to like 12, 14 inch area, and that to me is the most natural, and that's one reason I vote for boom over love, simply because love, being on your chest, 
is in an unnatural spot. That looks good to me. You know, we've got a healthy distance. Uh, I assume it's out of frame, right? Let's double check. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're out of frame, so we're out of good frame. there. Okay, cool. So what we're going to do now is take a little listen. Go for it. You work in the what? I work in the investments industry. Okay. And, what, and how oh. long have you been working there? Okay, so I've worked there for eight years now. So one thing that I like to do is I'm trying to grab levels is I like to um, have the person talk about things that they're naturally going to talk about. Because if you say, hey, say something, they're like, huh, what? And they have no idea, or it's like, oh, say something, and they're like, test, 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 test. That doesn't give me an idea of how they're going to speak, especially in an interview situation. It's like, we want them to talk how they're normally going to talk. So get them to talk about something that they can keep rambling. That way, you know, like, if I didn't cut them off to explain, I would kind of adjust my levels. I'd maybe move my mic around a little bit and say, like, okay, where do I like this? You know, and, like, dial in the spot as he's talking. Almost always they don't even know you're doing anything. When you are checking levels, where are you trying to get their loudest and their lowest volumes to sit decibel level-wise? Yeah, so negative six is the peak, which is basically, like, if they're mumbling and then, ha, 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 that's a peak. The low mumbling is, like, the lowest end. The average, which is referred to as RMS, I like to do anywhere between negative 18 and negative 12. But I'm happy with this. Uh, if you notice, I kind of moved it around and then tweaked the angle of it a little bit more. That's kind of where I'm aiming. So it's about, what would you say that is, Parker? 10 inches off his face. All right, so we got the NTG3 all set up on the boom pole here. This is a C stand. We're gonna pop on the lav mic. Again, this is for redundancy. Ideally, and probably won't use the lav mic, but we want to have it just in case. And I've shot in scenarios, even that new skin commercial that you guys have seen. My guy who was running sound forgot to push record, and so we had to use <laughs> lav mic for some of those. So it is important. I know it's secondary, and if you only have one, that's fine. But if you can, redundancy, get a second. A uh, lav mic on him. So what I look for is um, in the middle of the cleavage, right? So when a person has a really flat chest, it's a lot harder to, to hide the mic. But he's got nice pecs. He's, he's tough. He's buff. So we're going to knock this guy in right here. While he's setting that up, here's how I have mine set yep. up. I have it taped to the inside of my shirt. And like he said, I just make sure that the capsule here isn't being covered. I tape it to the inside of my shirt versus on the outside of my undershirt or to my body because if I sweat, that tape will fall off and yep. it's happened before. My mic's down here by my waist. What you're hearing is the, the G3, see right here, Sennheiser, G3. I have this set to yep. sensitivity negative 30 dB yep. on so, the transmitter mm -hmm. and then the receiver, what'd you have that set to? Zero on the receiver is what I've done for years and I have never had a distortion issue. We all set? I think so. Cool. Camera settings. Now I love, you guys know I love those shallow backgrounds. So we're going to a 1.4 aperture on both cameras. Actually, that one's a 2.8, I believe. So 1.4 aperture on this. ISO is at 100. I get asked this a lot. I've just adjusted my shutter speed up to 1 500th to compensate for the fact that I'm bringing down my uh, aperture down to 1.4. Now, when you can, you should bring that down to just double the frame rate, which in this case, we're shooting 24 frames per second on both cameras. Ideally, my shutter speed would be 1 50th, so just double of, one, of 24 frames per second, but call it lazy or quick run and gun, I don't like to fiddle with having ND filters, and so I'm okay in most cases just bumping up that shutter speed. Now, because there's not a lot of motion to begin with, the most movement he's gonna be doing is maybe raising his arm or focusing on his face and what he's saying. So I'm personally okay in these types of scenarios where there's not a lot of movement anyway, to bump that up, or if I'm shooting slow-mo, and I'm gonna be slowing it down anyway, I'm okay bumping that shutter speed up um, higher than what is normal and right for filmmakers. So, all right, so 5,500 Kelvin there. Make sure this guy's also 5,500 Kelvin. All right, let's talk about the Rhino slider. Now, probably the biggest benefit to having a Rhino slider, in this case, two Rhino sliders, is I get to have movement, awesome cinematic movement, going back and forth, parallaxing. I'm gonna have it on a loop so it's continuous, going the whole time while I'm just sitting here talking to the interviewee. And so I get to focus all my attention on the person I'm interviewing while I'm getting amazingly cinematic camera movements from my sliders. And what does this do? This allows me to focus my attention on this person that I'm talking to. I mean, ideally you'd have multiple people on set that could listen in an audio and like we have an audio guy here, but if it was just me, I would let these cameras run and I would have headphones on so I can hear his audio, make sure it's clean, 
and then just chat with him. What this is going to allow you to do is normally if you would need multiple cameras to be able to get manually people pushing you know, these sliders to get that awesome cinematic movement the whole time, one, it's gonna be inconsistent to have it manually being pushed, but two, you're gonna to have to hire two people and somebody to talk to him to be able to do that, to have two cinematic angles that are both moving and someone talking to the subject. So I just saved a bunch of money by not having to hire two people to run both of these cameras. So I'm now going to go through the settings with the Rhino slider to show you how I would set this up. All right, so we'll create a move. It's going to calibrate, say go. It's gone to one side. I'm going to set my endpoint. So now I'm adjusting to get my framing, get them on a third. So put them about right there. Like it, good. Set my endpoint. It's now going to mosey on over to the other side of the track. And then once it reaches this end, we're just going to scroll the wheel and I'm going to try and keep him in that same spot, that same third of the frame. So that way it's a parallax. It's going to look like he's not moving in the frame, but everything behind him is moving. I'm going to set it at 14 seconds to start with and see how I like that amount of motion. And I'm also going to ramp. We'll do maybe four inches of ramp. What the ramp means is as it's getting to the end of the track, it's going to kind of slow down, kind of like a speed ramp. And then last thing is to turn on the loop. Because we're doing a continuous interview that may last a half hour or so, Turn the loop on, that way it'll keep going back and forth. And go. So I'm testing out the speed to make sure I like how fast it's going. Now I'd say that's a little bit too fast. For the interview we're doing, it's not super intense or anything. So that might be a little too fast. So I'm gonna go back into my settings, change the duration to 25 seconds. That was a good amount of movement. I felt like I could see it move. It felt cinematic without it being too fast or too slow to where I couldn't tell it wasn't moving. So, I like that amount of movement. Let's go ahead and get this one set up, same thing. And then set our in and out points again. We're gonna try and put him on a third there. Set the in point, set the out point, keep him on that third. And by the way, we have autofocus on this and I'm gonna just select it on his face. For interviews, I like using the tracking autofocus because it'll keep, if this distance changed at all, if it was like going closer and farther away, that, that auto tracking would keep his face in focus the whole time. So it's kind of nice to have an autofocus going during these sliding moves. Now duration on this, I'm probably gonna go 17 seconds. So we got both cameras, look at that. It's automated. These guys are shooting me cinematic shots for hours. So we'll go ahead and roll both of these cameras. Okay, so as far as interviewing somebody, the actual process of interviewing somebody, I got my cameras rolling just fine. I'm gonna be sitting in this chair, chatting with him, asking him questions, trying to get organic answers, organic uh, conversation with him. Now what we're interviewing about today is actually a testimonial about my course, Full-Time Filmmaker, and if it's effective, how it's effective. So I have Jake, who's actually now my assistant that I've hired, but started out as my student taking Full-Time Filmmaker. I'm gonna ask how Full-Time Filmmaker, the course has been effective in helping him, you know, further his business and freelancing as a videographer. And so in these types of situations, a couple tips to interviewing somebody, like I said, number one, have them look at an actual human being if you can. It's gonna be much more natural for people. If they are looking into the camera, make sure they know how to do it well and they practice. And people ask me, what, what kind of questions should you ask to provoke good answers? And it really just depends on the type of content you're shooting. But one tip I will give, prepare some questions, yes, but don't stick to just those questions. In other words, most people, the mistake they make when they're interviewing somebody, they have a list of questions in front of them. They'll ask one, so what do you think about this? They'll look at them, they'll start talking, they'll give their attention for about three seconds, and then they'll start looking at their sheet, their notes, looking for the next question they're gonna ask. That person they're talking to doesn't feel like they're having a conversation anymore. They feel like they're being interviewed. You can look at those later, but focus on the person you're interviewing and listen. That's one of the biggest things people don't do. They're thinking about their next question instead of listening to what the person's actually telling you. The best questions, the most inspired questions will come from you listening to the person giving the answers. And so as you listen, you will come up with better questions off of the things they're saying that will help you create more organic conversation. So I actually have no questions prepared. And so they will all be inspired off of listening to what he says to me. But we are now ready to shoot. So I'm gonna go ahead and roll on cameras. So before you start an interview, like Brenner just said, you wanna make sure to give you a nice sync up, a visual and audible sound and visual so you know how to sing these open posts. Go ahead, give us a nice clap. All right, Jacob Weisler, how has full-time filmmaker impacted your video business since joining the program? So I started full-time filmmaker last summer 
And at the time I had zero clients, I had zero experience, and honestly I didn't really know how to use cameras. And so I took a leap of faith, I took Parker's course, and I saw results immediately. Not just with my business, but with my confidence operating cameras, working with clients, how to land clients in the first place, and then improving the quality of my videos, which led to more clients and more clients and more clients. What has been the most valuable part of full-time filmmaker that has helped you grow as a filmmaker? For me, the most valuable thing, uh, the biggest takeaway from full-time filmmaker has been Parker's ability to break down the most complex skills and abilities and methods and principles into a very simple and very basic, easy way to apply it into your own life. Would you recommend this program to other people and for those who don't know about it and are thinking about getting it, what do you have to say to them? Something Parker said when I very first came across Full-Time Filmmaker that had stayed with me this whole time is if you want people to invest in you as a filmmaker and as a business, you need to be willing to invest in your business. Full-Time Filmmaker, in my opinion, is 120% worth every penny it's asking for. I highly recommend it to every single person I come in contact with. Anyone who messages me asking me things, I say, here's what I do, but check out Full-Time Filmmaker. It's the most beneficial thing you could do. Awesome. Okay, go ahead and cut. All right, guys, that's it for how to shoot an interview. Hope you learned something new. If you guys want to check out the full virtual job shadow, this was just a condensed version because we covered a ton of things. Go to fulltimefilmmaker.com where you can join over 2,700 students and growing. Check out these guys that are here, full-time filmmaker students. I think we had like 10 of them come out today to job shadow on this one. And uh, guys, was this beneficial for you to come on set? Yeah. I mean, I try and cover as much as I can in the videos, but part of the program of Full-Time Filmmaker is to be able to come on set with me and learn in person. Would you get, I mean, I haven't, I haven't prepped them for this. Would you guys recommend people joining Full-Time Filmmaker? Absolutely. Yes. Okay, I mean, they said it, not me. Anyway, if you guys want to get a setup like the one you see here, guess what? We're actually doing a contest. Yes, you can win this entire setup. Well, what you can win is a Rhino slider like the one you see here, the full decked out version with the Rode NTG3. And you can also get the Aperture 120D with the light dome. So if you guys want to get started on building your professional setup to do awesome interviews like this for your business, then make sure to check the link in the description. But that's it guys. If you have any further questions for me, please let me know.